It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by emailrevealer.com. You can go to emailrevealer.com, get an autographed copy of my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator. Uh, also, too, you can thank cart-king.com, 877-986-7771. If you've ever thought about going into the mobile cart or kiosk business, cartking.com has been in business for 20 years. Uh, working with clients across America to provide indoor and outdoor carts for any application. So you go to cart-king.com. You see what kind of cart you need for your, you, know, you want to sell coffee, food, uh, T-shirts, souvenirs, um, in a lobby or indoors, outdoors, uh, in the middle of a mall, airport. You see what kind of model applies to your business. They'll custom design it for you, custom ship it for you, uh, custom build it for you, and ship it worldwide. Cart-king.com. Boy, I'm stumbling over my tongue today. Pure Soap Flake Company. You can bathe your body and wash your clothes with Pure Soap products that are free of fragrance. GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Uh, it's, it's safe for drains and waterways. Uh, it's good for the kinds of living creatures and sensitive skin. Your little baby's uh, onesie. You want to put that in this chemical infested crap they sell in the supermarket? No way. Go to puresoapflakes.com, greenhome.com, amazon.com. Uh, uh, or call 218-568-2525. Uh, Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. And give them a call at 218-568-2525. Also, you can go to WholeFoods.com and uh, pick it up over there. AlmightyGold.com. Gold! Get your gold in affordable quantities. As little as a tenth of a gram, you can start investing in gold today for 6 bucks. The gold comes to you, shipped to you in little credit cards, uh, it's like embedded into a credit card, a plastic card. They'll let a tenth of a gram, six bucks, one gram, two and a half grams, five grams, no minimum purchase required. Uh, you can also become a, an investor in, uh, in gold and cryptocurrency that's backed in gold. And if you want to make some money, you want a little side business, you want to make some cash, what you do is you go to almightygold.com. You sign up to become an affiliate for free, right? Affiliate marketing. And what you do is you get a, a link. They give you an affiliate link. Anytime somebody clicks on that link, you're not even going to know when they click on it, but they're going to click on that link. You're going to get a commission for anything sold uh, from that link. So you post it on your Facebook, your Twitter, your Instagram, your and even on dating sites. Put on plenty of fish, man. Who cares, right? <laughs> Someone clicks on it, and they uh, they buy some gold from AlmightyGold.com. You get a commission. You get a little notification. Hey, somebody bought some gold uh, from your link today. AlmightyGold.com. Gold. Mm. Okay, my first guest today is the great Diane Diamond. Now, I had Diane Diamond on the show years ago. Uh, the name of the show was called uh, Be Careful Who You Love uh, by Diane Diamond. And very, very popular show. I've gotten so much, both negative and positive reaction from that show. But I guess, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, my God, that this is a really, really a passionate topic for people uh, on certain sides. Diane Diamond, are you there? I'm here, ready to talk about Michael Jackson. Yeah, thank you so much for coming back. I really enjoyed our last talk. Um, sure. But, but for people who don't know who Diane Diamond is, who, who is Diane Diamond? Well, I'm I'm a veteran reporter. I've uh, always, well, mostly been focused on crime and justice issues. I started my career in Albuquerque, New Mexico at a radio station. I went to Washington, D.C., worked for National Public Radio. Then I got into TV in New York. And uh, for pr purposes of this conversation, I guess people might remember me from the old TV show Hard Copy, which is where I first broke the story of Michael Jackson. I always think of you connected to Court TV. You always see me on Court TV. Yeah, well, that was uh, when when his criminal trial occurred in 2005. I was working for Court TV, and we did it, you know, pretty much live. Cameras weren't allowed in the courtroom then, but um, between me and my my colleague Savannah Guthrie, who's now on the Today Show, I, I would sit in the court for an hour and a half, and then come out and tell everybody what I'd just heard, and she would go in for an hour and a half, and we sort of jockeyed back and forth for the whole. Gosh, it was more than five months. Yeah. 
Okay, so you can yeah. check out Diane Diamond at her website, dianediamond.com. And Diamond is spelled D-I-M-O-N-D. Uh, and, right. and the new book, the update to this book, the book is the excellent book is called uh, Be Careful Who You Love. Um, and uh, there's an update, an audio version only, uh, since I guess all the more recent developments. Uh, you can also contact, she writes a, a column, a Creative uh, Syndicate column. Creator Syndicate is my distributor, and it comes out once a week. I, I write about a, a broad range of crime and justice issues, not just Michael Jackson. <laughs> okay, so what's new since the last time we talked uh, with Michael Jackson? Well, you know, it used to be, Ed, when I first broke this story, and I'm going to date myself now, back in 1993, um, I first started reporting on Michael Jackson and the fact that cops were looking at him for possible child molestation charges. I have been, frankly, under attack mm. from the Jackson fans who say he couldn't possibly have done this. Well, now we flash forward to 2019. I, I'm thinking that many of the people listening to this program probably saw the HBO documentary Find, uh, Leaving Neverland was the name of it. And uh, on that, two young men came forward to say, as young people, we spent a lot of time with Michael Jackson, and he molested us for years and years and years. And they explained why they hadn't come forward and talked about that until now. Uh, you know, we, we know from the, the Catholic Church scandal, for example, that especially boys, they don't come forward and talk about their molestation. It's like a manhood thing, and they just don't reveal right away, and sometimes they never reveal. So after the, the um, Leaving Neverland documentary aired on HBO, I was again attacked by the Jackson fans, even though I had nothing to do with that documentary. I'm the one who first started this story ball rolling. Um, it, I've seen a big sea change over all that time. In the beginning, nobody wanted to believe that this could possibly be true. Um, that was 93. In 2003, I found out there was a second accuser. There was going to be a trial. And I was the only one standing outside Neverland, November 2003, watching the, the vehicles roll into Neverland to to search it for clues. I covered the trial in 2005, and still there were a lot of people who said, this is crazy. Michael Jackson could never molest a child. He loves children. Well, then that documentary hit on HBO, and people heard from the horse's mouth, so to speak, from Jimmy Safechuck and Wade Robson, and they described what they said happened to them at the hands of Michael Jackson. And now suddenly, here we are, where people are not coming up to me and saying, oh my gosh, do you think he really did it? Now they're saying, oh my gosh, I see now he really did it. And, you know, I don't know what to say to them because I'm a reporter. I'm just, I report the facts as I can find them and confirm them. And I've thought for a long time he was a pedophile. You know, you took the words right out of my mouth because uh, with all this time you've been reporting facts, but leaving Neverland was a lot of emotion. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, yeah. actually. It was. Wasn't it so emotional? I found myself watching it with my husband, who is also in the news business, and looking over at him, and just I was just weeping yeah. because the story uh, uh, of these two boys who really didn't know each other at the time that this was happening, and how their families had been also seduced by the glamour and the glitz and the travel and the gifts and the Neverland Zoo and uh, all of the magnificent things that came with being friends with Michael Jackson. And now they realize how they were used, or they say now they realize that they were used, manipulated by a man that just really wanted to get at their little boys. Yeah, yeah. What do you say to the people who say, well, I blame the parents? Yeah, you know, I, I hear that a lot. Yeah. And, of course, that's the parent's job is to protect their child. I'm a parent. I get that. But, you know, I dedicate one chapter in the book, I think it's chapter nine, to a man named Ken Lanning. And Ken Lanning is the former FBI agent who wrote the profile of a pedophile for the FBI. And he told me long ago that... You know, you need to understand that a pedophile's entire world 
revolves around searching for prey. Mm. That, that, I mean, they may have a job and they, you know, maybe a church going guy, pay their taxes, upstanding member of the community and all that. But in the back of their mind, they are the most personable, canny criminals that you will ever meet because the thing that motivates them is finding another child. And, and when they do that, they first seduce the parent into trusting them. And once the parent trusts them, well, then they have an avenue to the child. So once I understood that concept, I I got it more. Do do I blame the parents for allowing their little seven, eight, nine-year-old boys to travel around the world alone with Michael Jackson? Yeah, I kind of blame them. They knew they were sleeping together. Jordy Chandler's mother, the first young accuser, they, they, they knew that they were sleeping in the same bed together, and they allowed it. There's a part of me, Ed, I just I can't reconcile that. I would never, ever have allowed my child to do that. No, I, I hear you. And, and by the way, too, back to Jordy Chandler, uh, in that mm-hmm. situation, it was a very small home. It was a 1,200-square-foot home. And Michael Jackson and the little boy stayed in the bedroom. The mother would bring a plate of food over to the door. They'd open up the door, pull the food in. Is that correct? <laughs> Well, sort of like that, yeah. Okay. I mean, his, his mother and dad were separated, right. um, and mom had remarried, but then she was separated from that husband. So Jordy would go from his mother's house to his father's house, and yes, he spent the night with Jordy sleeping in the same lower bunk bed in the house with the boy. And his parent, his father, for example... I got a hold of his uh, log, his journal, diary, so to speak, and and he talks about walking in and watching Michael Jackson spooning his young son, then about eight or nine years old, in the bottom bunk of the bed. He said, but I didn't want to wake him up. Really? You didn't want to wake him up? I would have been screaming my head off, get your hand off my child's crotch, which is what he said he found. So, you know, again... In, in my head, I understand what Agent Lanning was talking about, that the parents are seduced first. But in my heart, I think that could never happen to me. Yeah, just recently, I went back and I read the, uh, the, the uh, grand jury report in Pennsylvania about the Catholic Church. And uh, mm-hmm. the, you're absolutely right. They, they, they are focused 24. I don't see how they had time to do anything else. Uh, well, yeah. and, and that's, that's so important. And, you know, yeah. I haven't just covered the Michael Jackson case. I covered the Jerry Sandusky case. Mm. I've, co- I've covered lots of child molestation cases, and they all had the same M.O. You know, if you're a preferential pedophile, that's what they call them, preferential pedophile, you're a man, someone could put a beautiful, voluptuous young woman right in front of you, or a little boy or a little girl, and you would choose the child every time because your preference is a child it just it sounds so sick to me but there are people like this walking among us now, now you say that you covered all the cases like sandusky uh, it, it, there's an interesting uh, aspect to this thing with the the gavino family arvino arvino family um arvizo arvizo mm-hmm. right arvizo. arvizo family i'm not good at names but arvizo now uh, <laughs> where michael jackson called his good friend chris tucker to take his private plane and and uh, you know move this kid over right uh, and then later on, we see Chris Tucker on Jeffrey Epstein's plane. Well, make of that what you will. <laughs> <laughs> we're all t- we're talking about sex with underage kids, aren't we? Yeah. You know, look, I lived in Hollywood for a long time, most of the '90s, okay. and I could never prove it, but I could tell you I heard lots and lots and lots of people come forward to say I was a child. There is a ring of Hollywood producers and movie makers and actors and famous people, d- down to the, the photographers that take the headshots of the kids, the kids that want to be actors, that pass children around. You know, it's, it's an ugly subject, and we don't want to think about it. And especially nobody wanted to think about it when I first reported it in 1993. Now I think we're starting to understand it more. You know, with the Catholic Church scandal and, and other, other stories that have come forward, and we're, we're getting it. We're understanding more the, the um, 
manipulations and the dynamics of it. You know, a pedophile doesn't go in and target a kid that lives in an Aussie and Harriet family. Mm. He, he or she targets.